And now we would like to begin our first session entitled A New Concept in Spirituality by inviting Daniel Assisi to join us. Mr. Assisi, an MPA, a PMP, is a member of the Board of Directors of the Blossom Spiritist Society of Los Angeles, California. Daniel has been an active participant in the Spiritist Movement in California for over 10 years and has spoken throughout the United States and abroad. Mr. Assisi works in the California Charter School Association as Director of Operations and Technology and supports over 900 charter schools throughout the state. Mr. Assisi holds a Master's in Public Administration with a Graduate Certificate in Public Policy from the School of Planning, Policy and Development at the University of Southern California and is credentialed a credentialed project management professional. Daniel lives in Los Angeles with his wife, Nicole. Daniel's topic today is Socrates and Plato, the forerunners of Christianity and Spiritism. Please welcome Daniel. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Excellent, that's the spirit. We are very excited to be here today. I am very excited to be here at the 6th U.S. Spiritist Symposium, um, celebrating, talking about love, enlightenment, a pathway to self-healing. And as we gather here in Atlanta today to begin, perhaps there's no better way than to look back in time to the forerunners of Christianity and therefore of Spiritism as well. And as we do that, um, one thing does strike my mind, which is an image, an image of sounds, actually. Imagine as if we were in a cave and we just hear echoes. And this cacophony of different voices doesn't always sound very uh, palatable. It's very difficult at times. We just hear all these noises. We don't know where they come from. We don't know um, who is saying them. We hear different voices. But in the end, when we pay enough attention, we are beginning to understand that all these different echoes is just really one voice, one message being repeated over and over again. And because it bounces off the walls and is said by different people, it seems like they're different things. But the more that we learn and the more that we look into life and the matter of things, we realize that even if different voices are speaking from different places in different times with different intensities, the message is always the same. And that is what we are here today to celebrate, an enduring message of peace and love, of evolvement that has been repeated through the ages. And even though it found its summit, its apex, with Christ, the most sublime soul to grace our planet, there have been many others that have served as his messengers too, repeating his message through the times. For us, it still seems like disconjointed messages but if we hear clearly and if we pay attention we will know that all these echoes talk about the same thing and today we focus to begin with on two of these voices that have been repeating the great knowledge through the ages and they are Plato and Socrates and as we look at Plato and Socrates it becomes very necessary for us to go back in time and understand the contest of Athens and Greece and where they live and what they were setting out to do. And nevertheless, before we do that, we wanted to do a short break and really come to terms first with some important spiritist ideas, which again are a reflection of this great wisdom of the times, to better understand the value of these many echoes, of these many messengers. So we jump right into it. What we find it is extremely interesting in the introduction of the gospel as explained by spiritism. Um, on part two, there's a great sentence that really grabs us sometimes. Great ideas never appear suddenly. If we see great words of wisdom, it is probably because it was built on words that came before. So the whole of history in a crescendo of learning that we receive has really been built slowly one step at a time through the ages by many different people. And that's very reassuring because it reminds us that we're all connected, that everything is going to be okay. 
And as we gather here in Atlanta today, we can say that would have been get, we could have been gathered anywhere else and still be hearing the same message. In fact, if we look into Kardec's work, we also find that in 1864, he published in the Review Spiritist and also later on in the Gospel, a very interesting concept which speaks to the whole echo idea. He called it the universal control of the spirits. And by that he meant that if a message is repeated from different, by different people in different places at different times, it is indeed a sign that is of divine nature. Because God being just wants everybody to have access to it. The word of God, knowledge, love, is not the ownership, is not the, for the benefit of a few, but instead for everybody. That is why he writes that a man cannot be confounded and can even confound himself. But that cannot be the case when millions of men see and hear the same thing. It's a guarantee for all of us. So as we go out in our lives and we listen to the different echoes that seem to reach us, let us never forget that that too is a proof for the existence of God. And two of these echoes, two of these voices, like we said, are Socrates and Plato. So to look at them, to really understand the whole picture, it is very important for us to have a better knowledge of what the times were like when they were here on, on the planet. So we dive right into classical Greece, around 400 before Christ, or the common era. And Athens was a city-state, and as a city-state, it was uh, very powerful at, at that specific time. It was the, the golden age of Athens. Um, he had just uh, left the Peloponnesian War, many different things were happening in the continent, and even though we think of Greece today as a country, it was really a group of different cities that behaved as a country. And in fact, Greece itself wasn't just bound to the by the boundaries that we see today. Many different cities, even in the south of Italy, were of Greek nature. So the Greek world was very large. It was a big chunk of the known world at that time. It was also a thriving place for intellectuals and for knowledge. We all learn in school as the birth of philosophy and the great, um, tremendous uh, involvement with different figures at that time. But we also remember that democracy first took hold in Greece around that time. So a lot of things are happening in Athens. A lot, a lot of things. It is a center of learning. There's lots of trade going on. It is indeed almost as if the center of the world at that time. So it is very fitting in this sense then that Socrates and Plato would grace the earth exactly at that point in time in that place. And it's one of the reasons why their message have been so impactful. In fact, to be honest, we know little of Socrates other than through other people. And one of these people is Plato. Socrates did not write anything, but Plato did. And Plato being his disciple left us a great deal of information. And in doing so, we are now able to fully understand the whole work and the wisdom of this great soul, Socrates, who many call the foundation of Western civilization. Many say that all the ideas and the thoughts that today we have are but footnotes to the work of Socrates. Naturally, we only have a short meeting of times. So we cannot revisit the whole of Socrates' life. And to be honest, I wouldn't be able either. Um, however, we're going to give it a try, right? Okay, so one of the most interesting things about that period of time that we often don't know is that it was quite common for Greeks and everybody at, uh, at, the, at the period of time to resort to oracles. They would even take trips to different places like Delphi, where there was a very famous oracle, the Oracle of Delphi, which was Pythias, the, uh, the, um, which you can see there on your side. And Pythia was actually the oracle of Apollo, and it was the, famous, the most famous oracle in, um, in Greece at the time. People would drive and visit, not drive, because obviously they weren't cars, um, but maybe their cart over there, to talk to, to, to her and to listen from her advice from the gods. And by gods, we understand spirits. So mediumship was very uh, prevalent at the time indeed. It just went through a different name because as we often repeat, the word medium itself used in the context of we know today mediumship was first coined by Kardec, which is a really interesting factoid for us. But nevertheless, the really interesting piece of it all is that the Oracle of Delphi was once asked, who is the wisest man on earth? And 
To which she replied, no one wiser than Socrates. After a while, it, this specific knowledge, this idea, this concept, made its way back to Socrates himself. And Socrates is a lover of knowledge in general, a philosopher, philo being lover, philosophy being knowledge. He was really intrigued by this. He was a very curious man, and he set out to try to understand why is it that the oracle would say that he was the wisest man of all. He talked to many wise men, and eventually he came to realize that they were not wiser than he was. And he was puzzled when he realized there weren't a lot of wise people out there to his standards. That's what he believed. And then he had another great understanding, a great awareness. He understood at that point that he didn't know that he knew that he didn't know. Right? After he talked to all these people, he then flipped his mind and he then understood that he knew he didn't know. Right? So all that he knows is that he does not know much and that makes him wise. And that is a fantastic perspective even to our days. In fact, that's a very modest approach because one of the great many things that we see um, with Socrates is a great uh, um, intellectual battle, so to say, with the so-called sophists, which were philosophers for hires at that time too. If you wanted somebody to argue in court on your behalf or make a case for somebody else, you could hire at the time sophists, which were highly skilled philosophers, people who know logic, to make a case for you. And clearly all you had to do was pay them. And there was no question of what you wanted them to act on or talk about. They would do whatever it is that you want them to do. Um, Socrates, however, was against this, this moral relativism. He was very relative for them to argue anything. They didn't care. There was no right or wrong. They just did it for the money. Sounds like modern days, doesn't it? But the interesting thing here is because Socrates was so wise, there are three really important things that his philosophy, his way of, of doing things uh, brought to us that we should really value to this day. The Socratic method, the theory of forms, which is absolutely fantastic, and the four stages of cognition, of understanding. And to talk briefly about the Socratic method, this is the way that he arrived at knowledge. And it really is kind of the precursor of the scientific method that we have today. He would, by talking to people in a method called dialectics, and the word has changed a little bit through times, so basically just talking to people at the time, he would invite somebody else to make a statement or a hypothesis about something. Then he would ask them a bunch of questions to see if they could disprove that statement together. And eventually, generally they did. And eventually the person who made the statement was led then through a conversation of questions and answers to understand that they too did not know much about the subject. And once they reached that topic, then together, the two of them would again, through questions and answers, review the topic until they arrived at a final destination, which is a fantastic process. Constantly checking itself. Another interesting thing that came out of this process and the method that he used is this idea and this belief that he had about the theory of forms. He looked around in the world and by talking to people, he began to believe that there was a separate world from the one we saw, and that he called the world of forms. And the world that we live in, he called the world of appearances. And that came from a very simple idea, so to say. Imagine a circle. We all know what a circle is, a perfect circle. However, if we look here in our world for a perfect circle, we won't find it. We find circles that are pretty circular and you even have measurements to see how circular they are, but there will not be a perfect circle. Yet, how come all of us know what a circle is, even if we had never seen a perfect one? Take a chair. We all know what a chair is, but have you tried defining what a chair is? Does it have to have four legs, three legs? Does it have to have a back, arm rests? Whatever it is, we still, when you look at it, we know what it is. So we are resounding, we are resorting to this idea, this form, this idea somewhere else that we all know, but that we cannot find here in this world. So it was very interesting, and through a series of different things, he came to understand that everything was its own thing, and that there was these forms, and there was a reflection of this in the, our world. Isn't that interesting? It's very fascinating. And he came to say that unless you knew the real thing, the real form, all you could say is you had belief in things. 
because you didn't know the real form. So everything in our physical world, it's more of in the belief phase. It's not really in the knowledge phase. So the really important thing, of, uh, the, the real important implication of that is that we see from the beginning that he starts to operate with an idea of an ideal world outside of our own, that things come from, and to which we are just a mere image, an imperfect image, which I find fascinating indeed. But moving along, he said also, he got really brainy on this. This is really brainy stuff, and even not having a lot of uh, so-called technology at the time. And he said, with the four stages of cognition, that as we look into this intelligible world, this perfect world that we cannot see, but it is the true word, world, and as we look in the world of doxia, of appearances, which is the word that he used, our world, he said there was a, a way for us to move up on understanding. He gave us a method. And this four stages, he said, here in the world of appearances, we start with the akasia, with the imaging piece. We just look at things and we take them face value. If we are able to start thinking and move it a little bit along, we start questioning that a little bit. But because we cannot yet attain full knowledge in this world, we move up a step to belief. Belief is a great thing, but it not necessarily means it's always right. The only way to move up the ladder is really to go up and start thinking beyond just belief and trying to find specific cases or ideas that would help us understand the world as it is really check things and that's when we go into dianoia and thinking which is already a skill of the other world he says and eventually if we did that enough and we were able to solve different puzzles and understand things we would see the pattern we would see how things worked and once we understood the form the pattern how things work we understood um, knowledge that was he called true knowledge so our quest he says in this world was to move from the world of doxy in our thinking habit to the world of forms. And that only came through exploration and through learning and through the practice of what we learn. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that fantastic? So, but that sounds very abstract, right? It's, it seems almost like an exercise of intellectualism. But he was a very practical man. He talked to people on the streets. He engaged them in conversations. He addressed real world problems, even though he was always intent of tackling the biggest problems there is. His work uh, that we hear through Plato, for instance, the, one of the most famous ones, The Republic, it's a book on how to govern oneself, but it really is about the concept of justice and good. So justice, a very fascinating topic, isn't it? We all have a sense of justice, but we don't quite know what justice is. For ju justice is different for some people because, again, we are in the world of doxia, of appearances. But to give us a better example how all this interacts, he has a brilliant allegory. Um, it's called the allegory of the cave, which really indeed is an expanded example that we take out of the Republic of Plato, the book, and we can go on in a little bit. And I hope that if you have a little bit of patience, you indulge me. And if I mess this up, I can always say, all I know is I know nothing. So. so imagine this. In a conversation with Glaucon, his friend, he said, Glaucon, Gla 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 Glaucon is saying, I'm not quite getting this. You know, give me an example. And he says, imagine that there is a cave. And this cave has an entry that is deep, far into the earth from the outside world. And inside the cave, along the wall, there's a one big wall over here. And in front of this wall, there is a group of people who are sitting down on chairs, shackled to them. And they cannot also turn their heads. So all they see is the wall in front of them. Imagine, again, that behind these people, there is a another little tiny wall, a parapet, through which um, people walking by carrying different objects right behind it. And behind this wall, there is a fire, a bonfire. And because the fire projects its light, as the people walk down here with different objects, the projects, the image and the sh shadows of these objects are projected on this wall over here. With me so far? Basically, it's an old school movie theater. Hang in there. And here's where it gets interesting. Now, obviously, it's a little, right? It's an example, so just run with it for now. So these people who are sitting over here shackled and unable to move their heads, all they see are those shadows. 
and they talk to each other and they see the shadows and maybe the people behind here carrying this are also talking to each other and the voice is echoing out in the cave and these people over here thinking that the voice is coming from the shadows. So those people that are shackled sitting down looking at the wall are having conversations about the shadows. They're trying to find out what's the next shadow. They try to remember the pattern of the shadows to try to make sense of it all. Now imagine the, for a second, one of these people here, they're shackled, were free and they could stand up and move around and turn backs. And when they did, they went towards this light over here and saw all of this. First, when they first saw these people walking around with these forms, would they recognize those forms? Maybe, but it would be very confusing because all they're used to is what they've been seeing on their wall, even though that is the source of the things that they see on the wall. And even further, if they kept walking over here, as they look into the fire, their eyes wouldn't be used to it. There would be pain and confusion and frustration. So in fact, their first natural tendency could very well be to go back and sit on that chair where they were and resume their world. But it doesn't stop there. Now imagine that we were, Socrates says, to drag this person out from the cave into the real world. And as they climbed out of the cave and start seeing the sun outside, how would their reaction be? Wouldn't they be even more pained and even more hurt by the light of the sun? Wouldn't they be even more confused to see the outside world? And maybe at first, they wouldn't be able to make sense of it all or even look out into the wilderness. They would have to look down and look into shades and look into reflection of things in ponds until after a long period of time, their eyes would slowly adjust. And maybe at night, they would be able to look at the skies because it's a little darker. And with time, they will be able to look at the sun, see the sun, and understand that that indeed is the real world. And that they, uh, the world that they're used to, that they have been living in, in the cave, is just a separate shadow of all of this. How do you think, Socrates asks Glaucon, they would feel about the other world? Would they want to come back, to go back? Probably not. They would realize that they're in a far better place now than they were before. They finally understood that that was just a part of it and that the real world is outside. But suppose that they did go back. Suppose that they did go back into where they first were and as they go back, their eyes have trouble adjusting again and they can't see very well and they start talking to their old friends and saying, hey, there's a world out there that's very different from this. But what would their friends say over here? They would say, that's nonsense. Can't you see that the shadows are right over here? All this nonsense trip that you've done has just really helped to worsen your eyes. You're worse off now that you're coming back and you can't even see anymore in here. Isn't that fascinating? So clearly, the allegory of the cave is a great extended example of our own existence and the whole theory of forms. We are the people sitting in those chairs, shackled, and only seeing that which is in front of us, the images. It is our responsibility then to try to break away from the shackles by thinking. And in so doing, make our way, even if in a difficult manner, towards the light and understand how the world, the shadows in the world, really are created. But it doesn't stop there, obviously. Because in this world of appearances, we can only know partially things. We see the fire. But if we really want to understand the world of forms, the other world, the spiritual world, then we have to do an even bigger trek out from the cave into the bigger arena of life. So in a way, what Socrates does here through Plato is really give us a very interesting model of the world, the physical world, and the spiritual world, and how our process is to understand the physical world and leave out into the spiritual world. And also, isn't it interesting that he also talks about coming back into the physical world? Yes, because Socrates was a believer of reincarnation and his reason was very simple. Souls are things of itself. If there is no reincarnation, then eventually we'll run out of souls on earth. So they have to be coming back, otherwise heaven gets crowded. Simple logic, right? 
But so it's very interesting a perspective on how he takes on things. But this example, the allegory of the cave, is really truly fascinating because it also shows how we live here on earth. But the fascinating, even more fascinating thing is that that person that comes back into the cave to rescue or try to convince their friends to leave with them to a better world, it's often called ludicrous or crazy or weirdo. Right? And Socrates was, in a sense, that very person doing that while he was alive. He in Athens was telling to convince, trying to convince people there was indeed a world of forms and that we should pay attention to that and not the, soft, the softest way of just making do with whatever it is that you have right in front of you. And in fact, his life is so extraordinary if we look at Socrates' life that eventually he gets convicted and is killed over exactly that very point for corrupting the youth, they say, for putting ideas in people's minds, for not believing the existing gods because uh, he also talked always about one God, which is very fascinating. But what really gives great testimony to the trial of, and that of Socrates is he was condemned by a group of people to drink hemlock and die. What's really interesting is that in the process, obviously, a lot of people weren't happy about it, and his friends organized an opportunity to escape. And he had then an opportunity to flee, but he turned it down. The guard that had been paid off to leave the cell open went away and the cell was open and he did not leave because that wouldn't be fair. He had agreed to put a social contract to abide by the laws of the, of the city and even if he didn't agree with them, he would stay. Plus, it would really not be nice at all for him to talk, do all the stock and not follow through with what he meant. He wasn't scared about death because he knew the life went on. That's really fascinating. That's really an example right there. Another interesting example to the character of uh, Socrates is he was married to Santipi. And Santipi was crying over him. And at one point, we are told in the Apology, she says, Oh, Socrates, Socrates, you were going to die. You were, and you were accused unjustly. And he turns to her. You know what he says? He says, Would you prefer it were justly? What a, what a, what a person, right? If you indeed want to go, isn't it better go for something you did not do than something you did? That was his frame of mind. And more yet, as he was drinking hemlock and his legs started to fade away, he continued to probe himself and see, oh, I do not feel my legs anymore. Oh, it's moving up. I do not feel my stomach anymore. He was always examining. And he said that unexamined life is not worth living. To the end, he was still carrying out his learning and a love of knowledge, which is quite fascinating. But what really I think is fascinating is his famous last words, which were, right, he's, di he's dying, his friends are over there with him, and he turns to, um, to, uh, to Crito and he says, pay a rooster to Asclepius, I owe him a rooster, and then he dies. I find it fascinating because Asclepius was the god of healing at the time, and if these are your last words, then you have a pretty, pretty clear conscience that you have not wronged other people, and that the only thing left at your deathbed is, oh, I should probably give a rooster to Asclepius, the god of, of illnesses, because now that I am leaving the physical body, I'm really curing myself. So to the end, with the rooster to Asclepius, is a testimony that he indeed was a forward-thinking man that saw beyond the world of appearances and into the world of forms. In fact, if we look carefully, we can do many different parallels with Socrates and Jesus. It's really fascinating how he is a very well-suited forerunner because he also did not write things down like Jesus did. He was also a vi victim of fanaticism. He, was also, um, he also questioned established beliefs and, and led people to think further than what they were used to at the time. He held virtue about hypocrisy and moral relativism at any point in time, and he taught freely. In what we call an allegory at the time, in Jesus' times, we call parables. They give us quick stories for us to know how to understand the world. And both of them suffered the death of a criminal. But ultimately, what is interesting here is that both of what Socrates talked about and what the Christ talked about are very similar in nature, only being that the Christ went deeper into it. But they talked about the illusion of the so-called forms of the physical world. They talked about the unity of one God. They also talked about future life the immortality of the soul. And if you look at it, not only is Socrates a forerunner of 
Christianity, but also with Spiritism, because Spiritism is Christianity revived. Seek for it. So Spiritism too. Because like Socrates, Socrates would have liked Spiritism because it's a progressive body of knowledge. It keeps learning. It keeps going. And it keeps trying to understand the nature, origin, destiny of spirits and their relationship to the world of appearances. See, it all lines up. It's all reflections of the same message that the Christ has left us in times. We keep hearing these echoes over time said by different people inside the cave that we are currently in. And these words from these great masters like Socrates, like Plato, and like many others that have come before the Christ and after the Christ tell us that we need to keep learning, that we need to keep moving on. And even if we repeat them ourselves and seem a little crazy and weirdo, like those who return from the light into the cave to talk to other people often do, like Plato did, we can always look at the example of Jesus, who not only came back into the cave for us and was lynched down and killed, but also came back after that to prove that that indeed was a world of forms and that you could indeed return to the physical world. It is with great, great knowledge, with this great knowledge and with great hopes in our hearts that we can bring that to our minds and our souls, that life goes on before this one, that love, that the love that we build here continues and moves on as well. And we hoped that as we continue to move forward and look at the different things and in different the world we live in and try to make sense of the next world, we will always look through the echoes in the cave to find Jesus, who has been calling us and sending different messengers into the caves, saying things that are still echoing until we're finally free of ourselves and are able to break the shackles and make our way to the light. And we hope that in this day, we will continue to open our hearts and minds to this message, to continue to learn about the Christ, how he indeed was a great coach. And throughout the day, we hope as well that we make wonderful connections that will make these echoes that we keep hearing in the cave over and over again become one solid voice that will truly lead us to happiness. Thank you.